All right guys, welcome back. Um, as promised in my recent video on how to train for muscle definition, I've started to take a look at the current literature regarding a variety of different training variables. So this is gonna be the first in this series, and today we're gonna look at training frequency. So as mentioned in that last video, there are a number of training variables. Obviously, number of reps, number of sets. Um, everybody is pretty much familiar with those. Uh, overall volume, which speaks to just the total work done during a session. Um, training frequency, which I'm gonna discuss in depth in, in this video, relates either to the number of times in a set time period, like a week that you train a specific muscle group or body part, or it can be used to refer to the number of training sessions overall in that defined period of time, like a week. But for the purposes of this video, I am going to discuss really frequency as it relates to the number of times per week that you train a specific muscle group or body part. So other variables include things that you may be familiar with, like load or how much weight you use for an exercise, uh, maybe not so much tempo or rep tempo, which is the pace at which you perform an exercise or pace at which you perform each rep, which is closely related in the end to time under tension, as well as rest period, the time taken between sets of the same exercise in order to recover. Now, understanding how best to train, quote unquote, best to train for an overall goal of hypertrophy or really for any other goal requires that you have some level of understanding of how these various variables interact with each other and how you can manipulate them to your advantage. I find one of the greatest challenges that people face um, when they're about to start a training program or when they are thinking about starting a training program or when they're considering whether or not they'll be able to maintain their training consistently is they feel as if they don't have sufficient time to train during the week in order to reach their goal. And that's something that I really want to tackle and address in this video when discussing training frequency. And you might be surprised by what the literature actually say at this point. Now with that in mind, let's take a look at what the scientific evidence currently says regarding the effect of training frequency on hypertrophy. And as we go through the data, just pause and think about whether this is supportive of what you expected or it's contrary to what you expected or it just doesn't align with what you feel is commonly held belief in the fitness industry. And to be honest, when, when conducting this research and really looking at what data are out there, I was particularly interested in what this looks like for individuals who've been training for a while, so experienced lifters. Uh, in particular, those who are not necessarily terribly young anymore, like myself. Um, so the over 30, maybe the over 40 group in particular. Um, so if you're one of those guys, you know, you're, you've been in the gym for, you know, over a year, over five years, maybe over 10 years, and you're beyond 30, keep watching. There's a lot in here specifically for you. Now, does anyone have the answer to the magical question? How many times per week should I be training overall or training a specific body part? And how long sh should those sessions be for me to really see some progress in terms of hypertrophy? Magical questions, no magical answers, unfortunately. Bear in mind, of course, that in trying to keep this short and simple, there's a lot more nuance to A, the scientific studies, and B, the way that they should be interpreted than I'm going to be able to cover in the video. But just keep in mind, it's not quite as simple as it may sound from the way I go through the data. There's a lot more nuance to it, but broad general inferences can be drawn from the evidence that exists. So in the studies that I've looked at, number one, the populations are pretty varied. You know, there are studies conducted in young trainees who may or may not be new to resistance training, so naive trainees versus experienced trainees, and there are individuals enrolled who are older, and that may be, you know, the over 50 crowd, that may be senior citizens, uh, males and females. So the populations that were looked at are pretty heterogeneous, and because of that, it's really hard to compare across studies um, but you'll find some general trends exist regardless. Um, another caveat to mention is that most of what I've looked at really is meta-analysis of a variety of studies sort of, you know, quote unquote, pooled together um, to improve the strength of conclusions that we're able to make. But despite that, meta-analyses have inherent, you know, drawbacks to them. And with that in mind, it's important to 
you know, sort of absorb the conclusions from a qualitative perspective rather than from a hardcore data quantitative numbers perspective because that's just not possible from meta-analysis of various studies. Something like hypertrophy requires oftentimes a surrogate measure. So to actually measure muscle growth or change in muscle mass or volume um, typically requires a direct measure such as an MRI or uh, ultrasound imaging. Um, you can also take muscle tissue biopsies and assess for hypertrophy. But oftentimes studies will use surrogate measures like circumferential measurements or assessment of lean body mass and so on. So it's important to recognize that a bunch of the studies have been done looking you know, either with direct measures as I mentioned or with indirect measures which are going to have very varying degrees of quote unquote accuracy and therefore relevancy to the conversation and how we're able to compare across studies which really is a challenging thing to do. Now first up, based on a meta-analysis of 10 studies back in 2016, a couple of researchers decided to compare the hypertrophic response in trainees training a body part once per week or a muscle group once per week versus higher frequencies, so two or three times per week. Now the data coming out of that meta-analysis was suggestive perhaps of a greater advantage in terms of hypertrophy of training more a body part or a muscle group more than once per week and specifically uh, twice per week as compared with once per week but in the end based on the heterogeneity between the studies and how they were conducted and the effect sizes that they observed you know they really concluded that in the end training a muscle group once per week remains a pretty effective strategy if you're if, if your goal is hypertrophy so the take-home message from at least that group of studies was that there may be some advantage of training twice per week but once per week really is quite effective. All right, so the most recent meta-analysis that I considered, that I looked at, is from August of this year. So 2018, it's only a couple months old, published online, um, and incorporates 31 studies across trainees within different populations. So yes, young, old, naive to re resistance training, as well as experienced trainees. The researchers were careful to select studies that performed their analysis on what's called a volume equated basis. So basically, the overall volume for a muscle group was equated whether or not the trainees trained that muscle group once per week or more than once per week. It would just mean the once per week group would have more sets and reps during their training session, whereas the multiple times per week group or the higher frequency group would split the total volume into different, you know, a greater number of training sessions. And in an attempt to be somewhat more stringent than perhaps other meta-analyses, what the authors did is they took a look separately at those studies which used direct measures of hypertrophy, so imaging studies, versus those that used indirect surrogates like lean body mass or circumferential measurements and considered those data sets somewhat separately and then combined the findings of those various groups of studies to make overall conclusions. Again, qualitative conclusions, not quantitative. Those studies using direct measures such as MRI to assess hypertrophy, there was data supportive of higher frequency training leading to greater hypertrophy. And on the flip side, there was also evidence in some cases of a once per week training frequency providing a greater hypertrophic response. And with that in mind, they concluded that not only was a once per week training frequency sufficient to elicit hypertrophy, but just generally speaking, training a, a muscle group either once per week or twice per week is sufficient to sustain that hypertrophic response as they didn't see any declines in, in muscle hypertrophy or muscle mass. And when they instead looked at the group of studies in which lean body mass was used as a surrogate indicator for hypertrophy, again, a mixed bag of results. So next they looked at the group of studies that utilize circumferential body measurements as an indirect indicator of muscle hypertrophy. Now the data were really difficult to interpret and this could be because when you're looking at circumferential measurements that's really sort of a crude way to assess hypertrophy it's not clear whether any increases or decreases in circumferential measurements are actually due to accretion of muscle tissue or you know increased storage of body fat or increased levels of intracellular fluid and it's just it becomes very hard to distinguish hypertrophy in that context using that tool all right so so far it seems that you know based on looking at a number of studies again in different populations males females 
younger trainees, older trainees, trainee, trainees naive to resistance training, those with uh, significant experience, there doesn't seem to be any additional benefit of increased training frequency as opposed to the once per week approach. Now, I've taken some pains to mention that the assessments that were conducted were on a volume equated basis. And why am I stressing that? Well, I'm not gonna tell you right now. Um, stay tuned for a future video coming up. Um, I'm gonna tackle training volume next, hopefully. Uh, unless in the comment section, you guys would like me to tackle something different, one of the other variables ahead of training volume. So with most of the data suggesting, you know, no real benefit of increasing your training frequency, well, what on earth are the actual take home messages? I mean, the data aren't necessarily crystal clear. And obviously, you know, if you're watching this, you may be young, you may be new to resistance training, or you may be older and you may be um, a more experienced lifter or some other combination. Now, what does that mean? What did, what did the data mean for your training approach? How should you be thinking about training? Um, is the, I don't have time to train, you know, five times a week, is that really a valid reason to not get started? So here are sort of the takeaways from the data that currently exist. A couple of key messages. Number one, don't get too hung up on training frequency, just get started. Uh, number two, Training frequency and training volume uh, significantly overlap and we'll talk more about that in the future video as I mentioned. Higher training frequencies may provide an additional hypertrophic benefit in the sense of they may provide a novel stimulus and it's been demonstrated and I, I didn't cover this and I may cover it in the future but it's been demonstrated that the novelty of stimulus um, and varying the exercises that you perform may produce greater hypertrophy just based on uh, you know, having a novelty effect. So that's one way in which training frequency can be manipulated in order to elicit a greater hypertrophic benefit. So something to keep in mind. But if you're going to lean towards the high frequency training approach, there's gonna be some benefit of essentially cycling through periods of high frequency and low frequency training for each of the muscle groups that you're interested in you know, increasing in size. Thirdly, if you are both a young and a new trainee, the world is your oyster. Um, don't get caught up in the training variables. Get started, lift hard, you're going to see the benefit. Number four, if you're like me and you're sort of an older trainer, and I don't really like using the word older referring to myself, but if you are in an over 30s crowd, maybe you're in the over 40s crowd, um, and you're an experienced lifter, then you know training volume is gonna be the thing for you to pay attention to, so more to come on that in an upcoming video. Stay tuned for that. All right, so that's pretty much it for a very quick and somewhat simplified look at the impact of training frequency on muscle hypertrophy. If you found the video to be informative and helpful, then as always, give it a thumbs up. Um, again, leave your comments with whether or not the findings of the data that we have so far are in line with A, your experience, B, with what you consider to be commonly held belief, and C, if, there's, you know, if the data support what you're currently doing. As always, guys, be sure to subscribe so that you receive those notifications for future Jawine Accent delivered scientific fitness related content. Uh, but until the next video, guys, aloha from Hawaii.